Welcome to our service this morning. My name is Colin Cargill and I'm your worship leader for today. And I extend a very warm welcome to those who will be participating in this service at a later time. We greet you as part of our extended family. We remember this morning that we worship on land that has been the traditional home of the Ghana people for thousands of years past. And we recognise their deep spiritual relationship with the land. We also give thanks and acknowledge all of those who have gone before us in this place. Catherine, would you like to light the candle and open the Bible, please? Lord, light the flame of your love in our hearts. Open your word within our lives. Our call to worship. Christ is our peace. We come together to raise and to pray in God's name. Christ is our peace. Christ is our peace. Christ is our priest. peace. Christ is our peace. For God's peace which passes all human understanding. We will now sing from Together in Song, number 653. This is a day of new beginnings. join together in a prayer for refreshment. O oh God, into the, the stress and tension of our daily lives, breathe the gentle, calming influence of your Holy Spirit. O oh God, into the fears and doubts that disturb our faith, O oh God, into the conflicted priorities and hopes 
of this faith community. O oh God, into the conflict-ridden world where injustice is reality. Let's take a moment of quiet reflection. Now words of assurance. Peace is your gift, O God. Peace is your heart and your mind and your spirit. Peace is your gift to the world, to the church and to each one of us. The gift of quiet acceptance, the gift of strong confrontation, the gift of simply waiting, the gift of active peace making. Peace of heart and of mind and of spirit. Peace is your gift, O God. Amen. Well, we've got a few of you all around the place this morning. Um, guys, do you want to come down the front here with me? We might end up sitting down here on the steps because there's... Oh, no, no, they're going to make some room. Okay, we can all squash in together. We'll squash in. Here we go. Can I go in the middle? Is that all right? Am I allowed to sit there? Okay. We're not in here. That's good. Um, have, oh, and Sophie. Sophie, come down and sit here with us as well. It's so squeezy. Well, guys, I wonder, when you've been to school, have you ever had anyone at your school who didn't know how to speak English? Yes. Yes? I've got a friend called Clara. Clara, and, and she doesn't speak English? She does speak English now. She speaks she English is. now, but she didn't then. Yeah, she's Korean. Ah, Korean. And when, how, which grade was she in when she came to school? I can't remember. I think she was in grade two. Grade two, yes. Yep. Anyone else have people, have friends at school who couldn't speak English to start with? Yeah. Yeah? How did you communicate? Speaking in short little words and things and helping them to understand. Look at a book and then there's words Ah, you had a book with words on it that they could point to and learn and then you would learn as well. Fantastic. Well, my boys um, went to a primary school called Challa Gardens Primary School. And at that primary school, there was something like 29 different nationalities while they were there. It was fantastic. It was like an international school. And they had kids who couldn't speak English there as well. And I said to Michael, my youngest, he talked about his new friend who I knew couldn't speak any English. I said, how did you communicate? How did you talk? And he said, we laughed the same. <laughs> we laughed the same. And laughter is the same in any language. Because it turns out it sounds just the same, doesn't it? So you can find things that were funny that they were able to laugh at and that they learnt and communicated with each other. There's a really lovely reading um, today in Ephesians where we're told that in Christ we are all brought together as one. That Christ has made a new, new humanity in place of two or in place of many. That there were people in Jesus' day who were quite divided about who belonged to which groups and they all sat separately. The thing about when you talk with your friends, when you talk with friends who can't speak English and you learn some of their words and they learn yours, they become friends, don't they? And you become friends with each other. It's one of the things that I think sometimes as adults we find the hardest thing to do. Starts off easy when we're young. We just play together, we share stories together, we learn to laugh together. Then as adults, things happen that separates us out. And God wants us to be together as one people. So all of us, and you guys especially at school, one of the beautiful things today in Australia is we have so many nationalities. 
so many different people from different countries that make us one. And it's good to be part of that, isn't it? It would be a really strange place if there was no one different. What happened to my boys when they left from Chala Gardens Primary School with 29 nationalities? They then went to um, Belair Primary School. And uh, my eldest son, Christopher, came home crying from school. And it was the first time he'd ever cried. And I said, what's the problem? He said, nobody's different. Everybody's the same. <laughs> they went to a school where there was only white people, Australian. Australians. No other nationalities at all. And that really shocked them because I was so used to having so many people who were so different. Um, so I think if we go to a school where there's people from other places, it makes our life richer and better, doesn't it? Multicultural schools. Multicultural schools are the way to go. Let's, uh, let's have a prayer together, shall we? Dear God, we thank you for each other. We thank you for our differences. We thank you that you make us one in Jesus. Help us always to share your love and to be your people in whatever we do. Amen. Amen. There's a great song we're going to sing called Make Me a Channel of Your Peace, which talks about us being God's people, sharing that love with one another. We're going to join in sharing that song and then you're leaving for some activities which this morning should be fun with the whole crowd of you. Let's uh, join together in singing. Let's stand. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Today I'm reading from the Hebrew scriptures from Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 1 to 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, said the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold 
and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And from the Gospel, Mark chapter 6, firstly verses 30 to 34, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And verses 53 to 56. When they had crossed over the Sea of Galilee, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring back the sick on mats to wherever they heard that he was. And wherever he went into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Lord, may your word live within us and bear much fruit to your glory. Amen. And now we'll sing together in song 459. In Christ there is no east or west. It's amazing, isn't it, how much people like smashing things. I was talking to some friends that they're about to demolish this big, old, decrepit shed on their property. 
And they said that they were having a working bee on their farm there to do this. And everyone wanted to be there for it. That didn't surprise me because even people who otherwise don't seem to have a violent bone in their body seem to relish the idea of taking a sledgehammer and smashing down something that needs to be removed. And I, I reckon it begins at an early age. I remember when both my boys were little, one of their favourite things was to stomp on sandcastles. It was much more fun than building them. In fact, as fast as you would build them, they'd want to rush over and jump on them and scatter the sand everywhere. It was lots of fun. Do you remember doing that? Yet still do. Some of them still do. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we don't seem to have quite the same instinct when it comes to knocking down walls of suspicion and hostility that divide people from one another. People were a lot more eager to pull down the physical Berlin Wall than they were to truly reconcile east with west on either side. The task of rebuilding the society with justice and equality for those on either side was an ongoing and is an ongoing challenge. But things are similar here in Australia. Only we don't have a physical wall to symbolise it. In some parts of Australia, the level of suspicion and hostility between black and white communities is as bad as any ethnic conflict anywhere in the world. We might have finally managed to make our national apology our national apology to the stolen generations. But the gap between standards for indigenous and incoming peoples for things like infant mortality, malnutrition, preventable illnesses, unemployment, imprisonment, are among the most extreme in the world. We may not have built a physical wall, but the division in our society is deep, and high and wide. The passage we heard from the letter to the Ephesians describes Jesus Christ as being on a mission to break down the dividing walls of hostility in order to make one new united humanity. It's clearly a task with a long way to go. In that passage, the discussion is about breaking down the barriers between the Jewish and Gentile communities of the first century. But that doesn't mean that it stops there. It's worth having a good look at what was said in that passage because this is the barrier to which the New Testament gives the most attention. And the principles developed there have constant implications and consequences as we seek to address the divisions we now face. The letter describes the divisions quite clearly. One group had access to the rich heritage and patterns of relating to God, that sacred alliance between God and Israel, an alliance that was built on generations of understanding and promises and mutual obligations. The other group had no access to this heritage. They were seen as groping in the dark, especially when it came to finding ways to make contact with God. Well, Christ wanted to make one humanity out of the two groups. But he recognised that Israel's pattern of relating to God and to each other had evolved into a complex set of rights and regulations and cultural ways of being that were not particularly inclusive. It was no longer something that could really function as a light to the Gentiles and thus draw all people into that sacred relationship. So, according to Paul, Christ did away with it. He abolished it as a way of relating to God. In its place was a whole new way of gaining access to God for everyone. That access was made possible at no small cost. 
to stand up against all those barriers that would divide people, to face the harsh reality of Rome head on, concluded in Christ being crucified. But that didn't stop that new community being established. Paul hammers the point home that God did this with both groups equally in mind and that we must now walk the same path if we want to have access to God. That, he says, should be good enough as a basis for reconciliation between the two groups. The principle, the whole of the letter of Ephesians argues is that our attitude to others should be shaped by God's attitude towards them. And when we recognise that God in Christ loves us equally, includes us equally, suffers for us equally, then who are we to start treating one another differently or to just tolerate the inequalities that exist between ourselves? There is even an illustration that we can easily relate to in our contemporary national and political life. The idea of citizenship. We know that foreigners in a country don't have access to the same rights as the citizens of that country. You can't just lob in here from another country and begin to claim the Australian pension, for example, or expect to be able to stand to be elected for parliament. Only Australian citizens have granted access to all these things. Well, Paul picks up this idea and says that because of Christ, we are now all citizens of the province of God. There is no hierarchy based on where we've come from or even how we've behaved. You, me, Paul the Apostle, Francis of Assisi, Dorothy Day, whoever it might be, all have exactly the same right of access to God and we all have to do it in the same way through Christ in the Spirit. Now note, this isn't just some theoretical equality without social implications. Paul is not just saying God treats both groups equally. He also says that because God treats both groups equally, the dividing walls of ignorance, suspicion and hostility between us have no basis and should be torn down and torn down again and again. Christ, if you like, is the sledgehammer champion when it comes down to smashing down those walls that divide us from God, that divide us from each other. And you can take that principle and shine it like a spotlight on pretty much any division among any people that you care to name. In the first century, the Jewish-Gentile divide was the big struggle. And it took them the best part of a whole century to sort that out. Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, also pointed out that the divisions between slaves and free, between male and female, are also broken down. I don't know if you can understand how radical that was at its time. How radical a way that was that we seem to have lost and it's become watered down in time. This was turning their whole world on its head. It's no wonder the early church in its first early years was persecuted so fiercely because these principles of equality and inclusion threatened or seemed to threaten the very fabric of Roman life where Rome was the ruler and the ultimate decision maker, where people had to just bow to the sets of rules of how you behaved. Religion was fine as long as it didn't disturb the social fabric. And here comes a faith that says there should be no barriers between us. Nearly 20 centuries later, we've still got a long way to go. We've still got more that divides than we can share light on. Many of us can barely imagine that life could actually exist without all those barriers that divides us. 
God in Christ loves Indigenous Australians and incoming Australians equally, suffers for them equally, and gives them access to God in exactly the same way. So isn't it time we took a bit of a holy sledgehammer, if you like, to the walls of hostility that have ensured that equal opportunities don't happen within our church, within our society, within our world. God in Christ loves born and bred Aussies just as much as God loves asylum seekers equally, suffers for them equally, and gives them access to God in exactly the same way. So isn't it time we took that holy sledgehammer to the walls of hostility that stop equality and sharing and love and compassion from happening? And God in Christ loves heterosexual people as much as he loves homosexual people, suffers for them equally and gives them access to God in exactly the same way. So isn't it time we took a holy sledgehammer to the walls that divide, that stop us from feeling and understanding and experiencing equality and mutual understanding. The challenge is there, my friends. The challenge is there before us every day. Every day there are opportunities for us to break down walls, to take apart those things that divide and allow us to experience that Christ brings us together as one. The challenge is there. The opportunity is ours. Together then, let's do whatever we can to break down the barriers that divide. And let's together build communities of love, trust, compassion and understanding. Amen. Amen. As we make our offering today, let us make it an offering of our very selves to be involved in whatever it might be that we might break down those walls that divide and bring us together as one in Christ. Our offering will be received. The spirit in which we offer our gifts to God is the spirit of thanksgiving for all God has given to us. The spirit in which we offer our gifts to God is the spirit of sharing for our identity with those who need compassion and care. The spirit in which we offer our gifts to God is the spirit of discipleship. We rejoice in the gift of Jesus Christ and seek to follow him faithfully. Amen. Thank you.
our prayers of the people. And we begin with a prayer adapted from Kendall Parish in the mid-north coast of New South Wales. We thank you, Christ, for your model of love and courage. May that love flow through us to others. May we be patient when change comes slowly. May we be kind when life seems harsh. May we be gentle when others feel bruised. May we be humble when things go well. May we be peaceful when anger rises within. May we forgive when we perceive being wrong. May we rejoice when the truth is discovered. May we persevere when the way is hard. Love never fails, but often we do. And I invite you in the silence that follows to pray for the people and events you are concerned about and the people you love and care for. God, lead us and change us. Help us walk and work together. We pray for those who have invested in a future that is no longer there and others who have taken a wrong direction in their lives. We pray for those who have lived by the land, struggled and strived, but now find the land inhospitable and market forces working against them. We pray for the poor of our cities across the world who have little to eat and experience little difference in their daily lives. May they all find hope. We pray for those who through their generosity, sharing their time and resources, help those who have been dispossessed or born in a difficult time and a difficult place. May we embrace the poor with true care, compassion and generous sharing of our livelihood and knowledge. We pray for our Aboriginal brothers and sisters, for a place to belong in this land and an equal sharing of the resources in such abundant supply. Help them to find renewed hope and acceptance from all who call this land home. God of peace, bring us through this time when climate change threatens the livelihoods of many, when species are disappearing from creation, when the future for so many is so uncertain. Give us a vision for life together, a renewed hope and faith in you. Give our leaders wisdom and grace, courage and integrity, May they make decisions that are beneficial to all who live in this world. May we as a nation be generous to the poorer nations around us and share what we can with all in need. And may we always welcome and care for the stranger who arrives in this land we call Australia. Transform us, loving God, into true followers of Christ to be people of peace, hope, and grace. In Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins 
and free to give birth to sin against us. Save us in the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And our final hymn this morning is from Together in Song, number 411, filled with the Spirit power. We leave this place of worship with a prayer for peace. We leave this place of worship with a resolution to serve our neighbour. We leave this place of worship with a commitment to our friends in the faith community. We leave this place of worship with a pledge to forgive those who have hurt us most. We leave this place of worship with a determination to bring light to the dark places. We leave this place of worship with heartfelt thanks to God who has given us everything. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God and Mother of us all, be with us this day and remain with us always. Amen. Amen.